As many of you know, I was not here last week. I was, like I said earlier, I was at the Festival of Homiletics, which is an annual event held around the country, and this year it was held in Washington, D.C. And it was a wonderful experience for a number of reasons, and I wanted to kind of give you a little bit about uh, what it was. It was a gathering of preachers from a variety of denominations. Uh, we were all mainline denominations, and we gathered together to hear fine preaching as well as lectures on the topic of preaching and politics, which I might add is a pretty apropos thing to be doing in Washington, D.C. So, we started uh, on the first night I was there, we started at the National Cathedral. And we did a worship service, communion service, and we ended that evening by hearing one of my most favorite writers. And if you've never read this person, I would highly recommend you start reading him because he makes so much sense uh, and sense of our world right now and his name is Richard Rohr. And he is a Franciscan uh, uh, priest who uh, has written extensively on a variety of different subjects, but basically his uh, main uh, subject is that we are all part of the one, and the one meaning God, and that there is, we tend to do things very dualistically in our lives. There's good and bad, there's black and white. In some faiths, there's God and Satan. And Richard Rohr says that everything that God has put on this planet is part of God's, God's work for the world. And uh, so he emphasized that. Uh, we also saw politicians. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren came and spoke to us, and, and uh, Senator Warren recounted, she's a United Methodist, by the way, and she recounted when she was, uh, she had just graduated from law school and was starting to teach law at one of the universities in, in Oklahoma, and at her local United Methodist Church, someone came up to her and said, I th well, it wasn't someone, it was her pastor, and, and he didn't ask, he said, Elizabeth, I need you to teach fifth grade Sunday school. And she recounts that story by saying, first of all, it, she, was, she couldn't say no to her pastor. As I've always said in this church, if Jesus came up to you and asked you something, you would say yes, and it's just the same for pastors. <laughs> Not really. Anyway, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, recounts the story, and, and she said with a lot of fear and trepidation, she went into teaching fifth grade Sunday school, and in Oklahoma, United Methodism is big, so Sunday, her Sunday school class was like 20 kids, and she was the only teacher in that class. And, and she was given the curriculum, and, and she was given a craft to do, and she said, uh, the first Sunday, she tried to do that craft, and she admitted to us that she was not a crafty, a crafty person. And by the end of the craft, it had something to do with blue paint. And she said by the end of the craft, there was more paint on the kids than there were on the paper. <laughs> but anyway, she, she also did the curriculum that was outlined for her, and, and the kids were just like, it was a snooze fest, she said. And so after about the second or third time, she said, well, I'm a teacher. I know how to teach. I teach law students. So she decided to start teaching her fifth grade Sunday school class in the Socratic method, which is the method that law school teachers use, which is kind of a question and answer. And she said that she never had any more problem with that class. Good story. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a slide that is kind of hard to recognize, but remember that guy that, um, that, that spoke at the royal wedding that, 
that uh, Episcopalian priest, and, and uh, there were a few things that were said about him afterwards, like a whole lot of things, and how people were really thrilled about his talk about love. Well, the, the right Reverend Michael Curry was with us one night, and uh, it was part of a larger event that was being held in conjunction with our event called Reclaiming Jesus. And it was a gathering of prominent religious leaders from across the country that had come to Washington, D.C., and they were rolling out a proclamation that they had written. And among the things in the proclamation were things like uh, there, there is, uh, there should be, or there shall be no discrimination against our uh, brothers and sisters of colors. There shall be no discrimination against our LGBTQ folks, um, among other things. And their inspiration to do this is that they had felt like the religious right had gotten, had kind of seized on the moment in this period of history and have kind of paraded their, their dogmas and they wanted to counter that. And so we were in this worship service with people like uh, Reverend Michael Curry and, and Richard Rohr and others, and then we, we did a silent uh, march to and vigil to the White House, which is pretty powerful. So all in all, it was a great event, and again, I thank you for allowing me the time to do this, and I just hope that my preaching has been inspired by what I heard uh, at this event. Now, on to preaching. In my days as a pastor, one of the things that I have heard over and over again is this idea of culture of the call. And simply what that means is that within our denomination, there are some of us, the leaders of our denomination, that have sought others to come into ministry, and so we call that fostering the call to ministry. And it is a way that we have identified young people and identified people who want to pursue ordained ministry or some call to some sort of uh, professional ministry. And as I re remember that, and as I remember what it means to be part of that culture of the call, that's precisely how I came into ministry. I received my call at an early age. I received my call by other people saying to me, Colin, I think you would make a good pastor. They started to see qualities within me that they wanted to see as part of the United Methodist Church. And so... Here I am, some probably 40 years later after I confirmed that call for the first time. Now, my sermon series, I'm going to be doing three sermons plus uh, two weeks from now. Um, I will be part of the musical that we're doing called Elijah, but... That's part of my sermon series as well, because it talks about the call. And what my sermon series is entitled is, Here I Am. Kind of a rift off of that hymn that we sing sometimes in church, Here I Am, Lord. Is it I? And so what I'm going to try to do in this sermon series is I'm wanting to talk about particular calls that have happened to certain people in Scripture. First Sunday, today, I'm going to be talking about Moses. Next Sunday, I will be talking about Jeremiah, and then the third Sunday, we will be doing our musical, and then I will end by talking in the fourth Sunday about um, the woman at the well. So Moses... We all know about Moses. Uh, if you had any experience in Sunday school, Moses was one of those prime stories, if you will. 
We know about Moses because the whole book of Exodus talks about Moses. And yet, if you look at who Moses is and the people that Moses attempted to lead out of the wilderness into the promised land, we still don't know a whole lot. But what we do know about the story of Moses is this. And that is that Moses was somebody that was dwelling in Egypt. He was in Egypt. He was born in Egypt. Do you, you remember the story of how he was born? His, his parents were Levites, as the book of Exodus says. And Levites were part of the, if you will, more slavery, slavery class of Egypt. And so Moses' parents were... Uh, generations represented generations of, 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 of peop, people past that had been dwelling in Egypt, as we read in Exodus. And, and, and so his parents gave birth to Moses. And we know that the Pharaoh was very concerned about the Hebrew people in, in Israel because they had a higher birth rate and, and the Pharaoh at the time said we should put to death all male Hebrew children. But for some reason there was this miraculous thing where the baby Moses escaped from the wrath of Pharaoh and he was put in a reed, in a basket made of reeds and he was floated down the Nile. And lo and behold, one of the women of Pharaoh's court saw this baby and got this baby and adopted this baby as her own. And this child, this infant, became Moses. We go on in the story. Moses is uh, now in charge, because he is of Pharaoh's court, he is in charge of, of the slaves of those working on the various construction projects. And if you've ever traveled to Egypt, you know the grandeur of some of the things that were built during the time of the pharaohs. We don't know, of course, if, if, if it is exactly true that the sweat of the Hebrews were part of that because we don't know simply how many Hebrews or, should I say, if there were any Hebrews actually in Egypt, but that's another story. We go on. We go on to the fact that Moses sees and is overseeing the construction of something, and he sees one of his people that are managing the slaves get mad at a slave, and he, and he, and he goes after the slave and starts to beat that slave, and Moses gets so angry that he takes that manager and he kills him. And it is then that Moses escapes into the wilderness because he knows that his life is in danger. Moses is adopted by a family. He marries. He becomes a shepherd. Which brings us to our scripture lesson today. Moses is tending his sheep. He, he, he's lost uh, one of his sheep. And he goes to find it. And it was there on the top of the mountain. As he's searching for his sheep. That he encounters a burning bush. And as we read in Exodus. It's a burning bush that just keeps on burning. It, it, it like has sterno underneath it it just keeps on burning and 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 Moses doesn't understand that until he hears that voice of God calling him calling out for him saying to him that Moses had been selected for a divine action Our story goes on. And after God calls to Moses out of the burning bush, Moses says, here I am. 
And God says, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then God goes on to describe the tasks for Moses. And it is an awesome mission and task and one that perhaps Moses is not completely willing to undertake. As I read the story of Moses, I think that there are several things that we can conclude about his call that relate to us. Number one is that God always and everywhere calls us seeking our gifts. God called Moses for a gift because God knew that Moses was the one that needed to be in charge of leading the people out of bondage in Israel. But there's another thing to, to, to ponder in this story, and, and it is this. Is it possible that God tells Moses to take off his shoes because he wants Moses to be himself? In other words, God is calling Moses not because of some grand sort of thing that he sees in Moses as much as what he knows Moses to be. And what he wants Moses to be is to be vulnerable and open to the call of God and to what God has to say. Another thing to recognize about the story and about the call is that God always and everywhere recruits from the labor pool he has. Or to put it more profoundly and to use a quote by Walter Brueggemann, who I heard this last week, and that is, God will recruit as necessary from the human caste in order to reorder human history. In other words, as I look out in this congregation, God recruits all of us according to our gifts, to quote the Apostle Paul. And each of us have certain gifts. Moses had the gift of leadership. He had, obviously, the gift of organization, or else they wouldn't have been able to get out of the land of Egypt. And in the same way, God recruits all of us, and God knows the gifts that we have to offer him. And finally, God equips us for the journey as necessary. In other words, God calls us forth and gives us the necessary gifts to move forward as God knows us and as God calls us. In Moses' story, we see that Moses, after his, after his encounter with the, with the burning bush, he still is questioning God. He, he, he throws up all these barriers towards God. He says to God, I, I, I can't talk. How am I going to do this if I can't communicate? Some scholars think that perhaps Moses had a stutter. But God put someone in place at the right time for Moses to go forward, and that was his brother Aaron. And if you read the story in Exodus, Aaron was the chief spokesperson, and Moses was kind of the CEO of that band of Israelites. So I think what the call means for Moses and for us is that God puts us in certain places at certain times. And I know it's been almost a year, but I truly believe, as I've believed in every one of my appointments in the United Methodist Ministry, that God has placed me in certain places. 
I remember talking this past week, I, I came across someone who served, uh, actually two people who served churches after me in New York. And we were talking about how in those particular places, we were called there for some reason. And as I left there and somebody else succeeded me, I left that place for them to minister to. And I think that the same thing goes for us, that God calls us to certain places. And for me, God has called me to this place and this time to be your pastor. And for that, I'm honored. We know that the burning bush was just the start of, of Moses' story, that, that, that life went on from there, and Moses truly did lead the people out of bondage, but he didn't see the promised land. He almost got there. But there was a succession and leadership, and someone else led those people into the promised land. But we do know that Moses was blessed by God, and that God blessed the Hebrew people by sending forth Moses, as God blesses us, as God gives us those stories about how all of us are called. Amen and amen.